Good evening, God's Prayer Warriors. Brother Felix here, and tonight we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 28. Again, we'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through verse 28. In the name of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, I give you thanks for today. I give you thanks for my life. I give you thanks for my beautiful wife, Teresa, and for my beautiful children, Emmanuel, Ariana, Carlos Felix, and Luis Enrique. I give you thanks for loving and forgiving us, Lord. I give you thanks for all your prayer warriors. And I give you thanks for all my brothers and sisters that will watch this video. Lord Jesus, I ask what I always ask in your name. May there be at least one verse for each one of our ears in tonight's reading. That would be two verses per head. And when we hear these verses spoken, may the Holy Spirit be stirred up inside of us. And may we have the courage to apply these verses to our lives. In the name of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alright, brothers and sisters, let's get right into it. First Samuel, Eli and Samuel, Samuel's birth and childhood. The birth of Samuel. Chapter 1, verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zufite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, the man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? <laughs> Once, when they had finished eating and drinking at Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the, a chair by the door doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness the, of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you 
what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Rama. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Hannah dedicates Samuel. When the man, Elkanah, went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Akana, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only the Lord may make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah, of flour and a skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I will give him to the Lord for his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. These are the words of our Lord, our God, brothers and sisters. Let's break down some of these verses together. Verse 1 reads, There was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. The book of First Samuel begins in the days when the judges still ruled Israel, possibly during the closing years of Samson's life. Samuel was Israel's last judge and the first priest and prophet to serve during the time of a king. He was the best example of what a good judge should be governing the people by God's word and not by his own impulses. Samuel was the man who anointed Saul as Israel's first king. Verse 2. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Although many old, great Old Testament leaders such as Abraham, Jacob, and David had more than one wife, this was not God's original intention for marriage. Genesis chapter 2.24 states that in marriage, two people become one flesh. Why then did poly polygamy exist among God's people? First, it was to produce more offspring, to help in the man's work, and to assure the continuation of man's family line. Numerous children were a symbol of status and wealth. Second, in societies where many young men were killed in battle, polygamy, polygamy became an accepted way of supporting women who otherwise would have remained unmarried and very likely destitute. Nevertheless, polygamy often caused serious family problems as we see in the hist in the story of Hannah and Penina. Verse 3. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. The tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was located at Shiloh, the religious center of the nation, as you read in Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. Three times a year, all Israelite men were required to attend a religious 
fest feast held at the tabernacle. The Passover with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. As you read in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Akana made this pilgrimage regularly to fulfill God's commands. You can uh, read Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 through 17 for the regulations concerning the pilgrimage. Verse 6, brothers and sisters. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Hannah had become unable to conceive children, and in the Old Testament times, a childless woman was considered a failure. Her barrenness was a social embarrassment for her husband. Children were very important part of society's economic structure. They were a source of labor for the family, and it was their duty to care for their parents at in their old age. If a wife could not bear children, she was often obligated by ancient Middle Eastern custom to give one of her servant girls to her husband to bear children for her. Although Akana could have left Hannah, a husband was permitted to divorce a barren wife. He remained lovingly devoted to her despite social criticism and his rights under civil law. Verse 7. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Part of God's plan for Hannah involved postponing her years of childbearing, while Penina and Elkanah looked at Hannah's outward circumstances. God was moving ahead with his plan. Think of those in your world who are struggling with God's timing in answering their prayers and who need your love and help. By supporting those who are struggling, you may help them remain steadfast in their faith and confident in his timing to bring fulfillment to their lives. Verse 8. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? I, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Hannah knew her husband loved her, but even his encouragement could not comfort her. She could not keep from listening to Penina's jeers and letting Penina's words erode her self-confidence. Although we cannot keep others from unjustly criticizing us, we can choose how we will react to their hurtful words rather than dwelling upon our problems. We can enjoy the loving relationships God has given us. By so doing, we can exchange self-pity for hope. Verse 10. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. Hannah had a good reason to feel discouraged and bitter. She was unable to bear children. She shared her husband with a woman who ridiculed her, as you read in chapter 1, verse 7. Her loving husband could not solve her problem, as you read in chapter 1, verse 8. And even the high priest misunderstood her motives, as you read in chapter 1, verse 14. But instead of retaliating or giving up hope, Hannah prayed. She brought her problem honestly before God. Each of us may face times of barrenness when nothing comes to birth in our work, service, or relationships it is difficult to pray in faith when we feel so ineffective but as Hannah discovered prayer opens up the way for God to work as you read in chapter 1 verse 19 and 20 verse 11 and she made a vow saying O Lord Almighty if you will only look upon your servants misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Be careful what you promise in prayer, because God may take you up on it. Hannah so desperately wanted a child that she was willing to strike a bargain with God. 
God took her up on her promise. And to Hannah's credit, she did her part, even though it was painful, as you read in chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. Although we are not in a position to barter with God, he may still choose to answer a prayer that has an attached promise. When you pray, ask yourself, will I follow through on any promises I make to God if he grants my request? If it is dishonest and dangerous to ignore a promise, especially to God, brothers and sisters, God keeps his promises and he expects you to keep yours. Verse 18. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Earlier, Hannah had been discouraged to the point of being physically sick and unable to eat. At this point, she returned home well and happy. The change in her attitude may be attributed to three factors. Number one, she honestly prayed to God, as we read in verse in chapter 1, verse 11. Number two, she received encouragement from Eli, as you read in chapter 1, verse 17. And number three, she resolved to leave the problem with God, as you read in chapter 1, verse 18. This is the antidote for discouragement. Tell God how you really feel and leave your problems with Him. Then rely upon the support of good friends and counselors. Verse 26 through 20, verse 25 through 28 reads, When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I will give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. To do what she promised in chapter 1, verse 11, Hannah gave up what she wanted most, her son, and presented him to Eli to serve in the house of the Lord. In dedicating her only son to God, Hannah was dedicating her entire life and future to God. Because Samuel's life was from God, Hannah was not really giving him up. Rather, she was returning him to God who had given Samuel to Hannah in the first place. These verses illustrates the kind of gifts we should give to God. Do your gifts cost you little, Sunday mornings, a comfortable tithe, or are they gifts of sacrifice? Are you presenting God with tokens, or are you presenting Him with your entire life? Samuel was probably three years old, the customary age for weaning, when his mother left him at the tabernacle. By saying, I give him to the Lord, Hannah meant that she was dedicating Samuel to God for lifetime service. She did not, of course, forget her much-wanted son. She visited him regularly. Each year gave him, each and each year she bought, brought him a robe just like Eli's, as we read in chapter 2, verse 19. In later years, Samuel lived in Ramah, as you read in chapter 7, verse 17, his parents' hometown, as you read in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Great reading, brothers and sisters. This is a chapter that I've read before, so I hope it was a reminder to those of you who have read this chapter, and for those of you who have not read this chapter, I hope you guys have learned some things. We should always be careful what we promise to the Lord in prayer. And when he answers that prayer, if we promise anything, we want to make sure that we keep our part of whatever we promise to the Lord. The Lord always keeps all his promises. Let's end in prayer, brothers and sisters. In the name of God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, I just give you thanks for today. I give you thanks for this reading. And I ask you, Lord, that if there have been any promises that I've made to you, and if I have forgotten to keep them, I ask that you remind me, Lord, 
that you remind me by telling me or, or in a dream or somehow remind me of any promises that I've made to you. I want to make sure that anything that I've promised you, Lord, I do. I don't ever want to not do something that I've told you I'll do, Lord. I love you and I thank you and all the glory belongs to you, Lord. I ask in Jesus' name that you forgive me and everyone watching of our sins, that you give us a discerning heart, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit and remove any evil inside of us and destroy the evil. I ask that you keep us healthy, happy, and safe, and that you continue to lead us, teach us, guide us, and protect us. In the name of Jesus, I ask that you heal us of any sicknesses, diseases, viruses, cancers, diabetes, arthritis, degenerative back disc disease, any knee pains, any chest pains, any pain in our bones, anything that's causing us pain or making us sick, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, I ask for healing. In the name of Jesus, I ask that you break chains of addiction, whether the addiction's in us or someone that we love, I ask that you break chains of addiction, of drinking, of smoking, of drugging, of lusting, of money, of power, of greed. In the name of Jesus, I ask that you break all chains of sin. If there's any sin that we enjoy doing, I ask and choose to do it, I ask that the Holy Spirit convicts us heavy in our heart and makes us feel sick in our stomach until we repent and turn away from these sins. I give you thanks for my wife and children and I ask that you bless, heal, and protect them. I ask that you bless, heal, and protect my mother, my grandmother, my sister Liz, my sister Yvette, my uncle Oscar, Sophia Borge, Henry Tim, Mom, Mrs. Betty Payne, Delia, Prayer Warrior, Brother Tracy's son, Joey, Prayer Warrior, Brother Ryan's mother, prayer warrior, Brother Ryan's wife, prayer warrior, Sister Teresa's daughter, Rikia, prayer warrior, our other Sister Teresa, her brother, Roman. I pray for any of our loved ones that are incarcerated, Lord, that you keep them safe. I ask that you renew broken hearts and restore broken relationships and reunite fathers and mothers with their children. Do not let any court system separate loving parents from their children. I ask that you, those of us that are unemployed, you help us find a job. I ask that if anyone's mourning the loss of a loved one, that you comfort them with your Holy Spirit. I ask if anyone has any suicidal thoughts or they have any d depression in them, that you remove any suicidal thoughts and, and depression and that you fill them with your Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit gives them peace and comfort and strength. I ask if any of us is going through any legal issues, if we're reading and, and praying and applying your scriptures every day in our lives, as and, and we have the courage to lay down these legal issues at your feet, Lord Jesus, I ask that you be our advocate, that you be our defender, that you be our attorney, and may your will be done. I ask that you bless you and protect all your prayer warriors and their loved ones. I ask that you bless you and protect everyone at the Kingdom Music Family Ministry, everyone at St. Paul's Lutheran and Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, and everyone at the House of Rest Church in Modesto, California. I especially ask that you bless you and protect pastors Brian Trejo, Angel Morales, David and Angel Rocha, and all their wives and all their children. I love you, I thank you, and I need you, and all the glory belongs to you, Abba, Almighty Father, King Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I love you, brothers and sisters. I hope you guys have a great night. God bless you. God's peace be with you. And you know we'll continue reading together. Good night.